Dann, äh, liebe Freunde des Kunstvereins, liebe Mitglieder, äh, ein ganz herzliches Willkommen von mir also hier im Kunstverein Hannover oder besser gesagt äh, aus dem Kunstverein Hannover. Denn leider können wir noch immer nicht wieder gemeinsam durch unsere wunderbaren Ausstellungsräume gehen, um gemeinsam die Ausstellung von Peter Schoolworth anzuschauen. Nein, leider sind wir immer noch darauf angewiesen, auf Distanz mit der Kunst und miteinander in Kontakt zu bleiben. Und so heißt es auch heute Nachmittag einmal mehr. Hier spricht, hier zeigt, hier sendet Ihr Kunstverein TV live und in Farbe. Und heute über den Atlantik hinweg, äh, verbunden mit Peter Schoolworth in New York City, der genau wie wir alle nun schon seit Dezember darauf wartet, endlich in die fertige Ausstellung hier bei uns in Hannover kommen zu können. A very warm welcome to you, Peter. Um, thank you for being with us um, today. Wir alle erleben gerade eine Zeit ungewohnter Einschränkungen, aber zugleich auch einer großen Offenheit für Neues und bis dahin Ungewohntes. Neue Ideen und Modelle werden ausprobiert, um auch unter den gegebenen Umständen weiterhin aktiv bleiben zu können. Und so hat sich auch unser Team hier im Kunstverein inzwischen äh, technisch wirklich ganz toll weitergebildet und äh, ja. immer wieder neue Dinge ausprobiert. Und so können wir mit unseren kleinen technischen Mitteln inzwischen hier solche transatlantischen Konferenzen abhalten, worauf wir alle auch ein bisschen stolz sind. Und äh, neben Sergei Harutonian ist heute auch unsere FSJ-Lerin Stella Gust dabei. Die wird heute die Kamera führen beim Rundgang mit Kathleen. Und äh, Leandra Busch ist wie immer auch technisch sehr versiert hinter den Kulissen und wird später den Chat übersetzen. Ja, wir alle hier freuen uns sehr, dass Sie unseren digitalen Formaten gegenüber so aufgeschlossen sind und jetzt schon äh, an den verschiedenen Dingen immer sehr zahlreich teilgenommen haben. Das freut uns sehr, weil das auch für Ihre Verbundenheit natürlich in diesen schwierigen Zeiten steht, worüber wir uns ähm, also ausgesprochen freuen. Und natürlich geben wir die Hoffnung nicht auf, dass wir schon bald an einem anderen Modellversuch auch äh, dabei sein können, um dann endlich wieder unsere lichten und luftigen Ausstellungsräume für Sie alle hier öffnen zu können und äh, die Kunst live und in Farbe, in echt und präsent mhm. erleben zu können. Bis dahin laden wir Sie weiterhin ein, zumindest auf diesem Wege, dem Digitalen dabei zu sein, wenn dann ab nächster Woche immer mittwochs um sieben Malerinnen und Maler aus Hannover ihren ganz persönlichen Blick auf das Werk von Peter Schoolworth ähm, uns schildern werden, ihre, ihre Ansichten, Meinungen zum Werk. Und äh, den Anfang macht Degenhard Androlat ab nächster Woche immer mittwochs um sieben. Es folgen dann in den nächsten Wochen Rundgänge mit Konstanze Böhm, mit Anna Eisermann, Peter Heber, Maximilian Neumann, Nikola Saric, Julia Schmidt und Tukpa Schimczek. Wie immer sagen wir natürlich auch Dank unseren Förderern in Stadt und Land, dem Kulturbüro der Landeshauptstadt Hannover, dem Niedersächsischen Ministerium für Wissenschaft und Kultur, der Sparkasse Hannover und der äh, Niedersächsischen Sparkassenstiftung und ich habe gesehen, Frau Schneider hat sich heute auch angemeldet. Herzlich willkommen, Frau Schneider. Nur dank dieser verlässlichen Unterstützung können wir auch in diesen ungewissen Zeiten unser Ziel als Kunstverein Hannover weiterhin verfolgen, nämlich die internationale Kunst nach Hannover zu holen und Hannover als Stadt der Kunst auch international erlebbar zu machen. Vielen Dank also unseren Förderern, vielen Dank Ihnen, unseren Mitgliedern und Freunden. Schön, dass Sie heute alle dabei sind und nun wünsche ich Ihnen viel Freude und spannende Anregungen beim Rundgang durch die Ausstellung mit Kathleen Rahn und Peter Schoolworth, der sich jetzt dazu schalten wird. So, ich begrüße Sie auch sehr herzlich. Können mich alle hören, Sergej? Ja, ich kann dich laut Wunderbar. und deutlich hören, Kathleen. Sehr gut. <lacht> Hi, Kathleen. Great, Peter. Wunderbar. Hey. Thank you very much, Peter. Warmly welcome again in the exhibition that we have installed for so many years, prepared yeah. and met in two years and which you have not have the chance to see. And um, I've sent you the, the, the article that appeared today so people can get a little view with us today. Mm -hmm. And um, we are starting in this first room that we, um, that we saw a little bit like um, 
a flashback, but also um, which starts with the basis of your work. When, mm -hmm. when you studied in Los Angeles at the CalArts University, you were not yet painting. You were more drawing and uh, doing installations and films. And um, I'm standing here prepared with my gloves in order to show <laughs> uh, the, the little book that is laying here. Uh -huh. um, probably you can um, just start here directly. Well, perhaps the content. Could, could we show them the alphabet before we, we look at the book so they can understand how it works? The, the you mean the, the image on the wall? Yeah, I think that's sort yeah. of the starting point for the book. Yes. I hope it captures well here. Can you hear me? So, mm. it, so this show starts in 1991. Um, and one of my first projects that uh, in school was to create this new alphabet. Um, there were a lot of conversations at the time um, in, in the early 90s about identity and how identity could, um, you know, was created through language. So I had the idea to create a new alternative lexicon, this new alphabet that had every letter of the alphabet combined with every other letter, so that it would allow me to write a word that said two words simultaneously. So I would superimpose two letters on top of each other to create a new character. So the top <clears throat> row of that triangle you see is A combined with every letter of the alphabet. And then the second line is B combined with every letter. Mm -hmm. So what I did is I just tried, decided to write a book in this alphabet and I created the, the rule that I could create any word so long as the two words that made up this word had the same number of letters. And from this, I sculpted a whole sort of bestiary of small golden creatures and this book, which tells a story of these creatures that existed in this kind of libidinal space between uh, categories in the, the traditional 26 character alphabet. So it was kind of a, a fantasy space that opened up inside of this, our normal way of speaking that allowed um, different kind of identities and different objects to exist. Um, and very importantly, this alphabet and this language could only be spoken by machines. So I would take one uh, word and record it on one track and a second word on a second track and I would play them back simultaneously. So the first character in the book you see here is called Clover Walrus. It's a clover combined with a walrus, which is hard to imagine, but this can only exist because these both have six letters. And that's kind of how the logic of this world worked. It was kind of a way to open up a, a new kind of shadow space inside of the way we use the English language to kind of create some free space that uh, this imaginary fantasy could happen. And there's something already in this work which will follow in, in a lot of other works later, this question of the, the space in between, the right. space in between mm -hmm. objects, the space in between human beings, the space in between us versus the virtual world. And I think this is, a, for us, it was very clear to have this as an opener. Mm -hmm. And also to, um, which is an interesting is that you create your own world within this alphabet it's what you also develop with these um, drawings that we are um, that we are showing here, where again this this uh, this yeah, mutation of two works, uh, two words with four letters that they come together is is shown in here. Yeah. So this Indeed. was a project from uh, about two years later. It was called the eighty three altered states of America, and I decided to try to. These projects all worked from through what I kind of see as an algorithmic logic. You know, it was kind of applying a rule to a body of information to kind of see what happens and, and hopefully open up some free space um, within the, you know, tr the traditional way we imagine, in this case, making a map. So I kind of created this, you know, I, I combined all the states in the continental United States that had the same number of letters to create this, what I thought of as a kind of delirious cartography or a, a fantasy space for for existence within the traditional map of the United States. And I called this the altered states. Um, and I kind of thought of this at the time, this is when um, you know, the, the, the internet was just beginning. And I think my friends and I were all very excited and trying to imagine what this new space was going to be like that we were hearing about um, this digital space. But to remind, it was in 1995, 96, mm -hmm. when you right. have created these, these and probably we, we can go to the second one and maybe also um, 
people can get um, the impression here that we try to um, install this it more installatively because of the two colors, this binary colors that you use red and blue, probably you can um, just give the principle of it a little bit. Yes, yeah, so the, the, the iconography here had to do with anything I thought might, have, might, might relate to being in an altered state. And it has this kind of almost medieval uh, illuminated manuscript aesthetic that um, was a kind of a creating networks between colors and numbers and shapes. And um, it kind of unfolds as a cycle in the show in which the original show in which you see every combination of every possible state surrounded by images of altered states. You know, and that could be anything from the coming kind of cyber culture to uh, drug taking to sexual ecstasy to you know celebrity culture to the weirdness of suburbia and the, the world was changing very rapidly at this time technologically and I think this was this new cartography was a way of imagining a new mental space that could be coming soon um, and creating this algorithmic logic that was kind of almost like computer code that would maybe be a way of getting a feeling of what this this time was like it's about mind extension of um, uh, thinking in mind extensions and maybe um, we can show the this this largest one of the series where there is also this figure of the joker kind of um, who's leading whom or who's who has the cards in the hand probably you can say something in america we have this character in the uh, kind of vernacular culture called uh, uncle sam and this is kind of a a sinister Uncle Sam that was was sort of you know deliriously leading uh, the creation of the altered states of America, almost like a an Abby Hoffman character or a '60s counterculture character. It was also maybe uh, related to the the early optimism of the internet, which was you know this kind of utopian counterculture thinking that the internet was going to bring everyone together, and there was going to be all kinds of new parties and rebellion and sharing and a peer to peer sharing economy which we soon realized this space would be privatized and commercialized, but there was an optimism at the time that was yes, very and much- Yes, and a um, large utopia about the whole internet of freedom yes. and um, yeah, that's-, that's on, it's and often, People triangle. often forget that, how that's changed, but in the nineties, it really was this exciting yeah. time of uh, optimism and utopianism for what was people were hoping was going to come. That was still on view in the nine in the late 90s in 97 on the documenta that Katrin David um, curated, by the way, mm -hmm. where it was still this computer uh, net uh, internet art was in this utopian way of some some nerds who believed into freedom and um, and and another thing is you also um, choose quite occult symbols like the triangle and we have candles in the exhibition. Like this triangle, is it like, like um, what is it for you in this? Well, the, the inverted triangle is always kind of, a, a, you know, it's an image of inverting power structures and, and allowing freedom to exist in a very oppressive system, uh, which again, I think we connected to what the internet could bring. Um, but at the time at CalArts, I was, I was quite um, intri intrigued by the early conceptualism of artists like Solowit and Anna Darboven and Mel Bachner and artists that created systems in, that govern through rules in order to generate some kind of visual chaos or a visual um, imaginary space. Uh, and I, so I was interested in conflating that um, sort of genre of visual art with the American vernacular culture of underground music and the occult and witchcraft, which I was involved with as a teenager, um, mm -hmm. that, that, that also similarly functioned through rulemaking and mathematics and systems, you know, much like computer coding in the 90s was, as you said, like an ultra nerd uh, hobby. <laughs> so yeah. I think all of these disciplines of conceptual art and coding and, and, you know, the occult actually were quite similar in how they hope to create fantasy space. I will, I'm already standing now in the, we go through this um, and just show the people how the candles are illuminated. And um, and it's it's also the time after the Kellards that you have moved to Los, to uh, New York, and you have on one hand started with your with your um, label, and you have organized many concerts and subculture again, but more electronic based. When I'm right, mm -hmm. and um, 
yeah, we have these vitrines finally, which are so uh, impressive where you can, we show them also because a lot of people that appear in your paintings later come out of this context, right? Yeah, this was a time, um, you know, I think we were all, many of my friends and I were, we were huge music fans uh, going back to the eighties where I was a DJ in high school and college. And the, the digital was, was becoming a part of life and music as well as the social dimension of life. And I think that uh, we were all kind of dissatisfied with what, what uh, software synths were doing to, you know, laptop based electronics were doing to musical performance, which sort of began, began, became to be something like watching someone check their email on stage and it was changing the way parties felt. And we were hoping to create, you know, a, a kind of a bunker or a kind of a gathering place where we could play records that we liked that were from analog technologies, older kinds of music that uh, the analog synthesizer became a kind of organizing principle for creating an, a, a kind of underground nightlife space that went on for about 10 years where we had parties every week, every Wednesday. Um, and it was called the, the yeah. Weird Party. And the, we started a record label. It was a, sort of a collective of, of a whole group of us. Uh, the Weird Records label and the Weird Weekly Party was a kind of shadow space outside of the art world and the music world that was kind of a bunker we all gathered in each week. It was a very spirited but, time. And in the same time, um, you during the day when you were not partying, you started painting heavily <laughs> and um, one can see it here in this uh, painting, for example, where we see the winter, we see people who, who, who are together, but in the same way, they are isolated from each other. Everyone is kind of like enjoying him or herself. And it's, it's quite manneristic, it's um, how it's painted. And um, yeah, you told me once these are not figures from the films, but all people you knew or you took as models already in this time. So you yeah, took so I, photographs. I kind of taught myself to paint figuratively during this time. And I, I was very interested in depicting, you know, the figure uh, in this changing, you know, moment of when abstraction was becoming much more a part of our lives in, in many ways. Um, and I think as we were all starting to feel we were made to be more separate through the way that uh, you know we communicated, um, I was trying to kind of convey that in many of these paintings of this kind of almost conflating the Baroque with the banal, how the everyday life was making everybody seem separate yet together at the same time. And I think that's kind of a feeling you catch with uh, with a lot of these paintings, um, yeah. which many of our which many of them function through allegory. You know, the the, the subject matter of the paintings I thought at the time were kind of almost like the making or looking at a picture. So you see me here in shadow. A shadow, yeah. <laughs> and I'm kind of almost the conductor or the director with my friends. This one was actually, I painted the background from life and I was really involved with a lot of life drawing. And I, I was really trying to learn classical painting and to create these kind of dynamic arrangements of uh, these almost fragile compositions that could fall apart at any moment where everybody was slightly alone, but also together in the same frame. And it's also um, that um, that you you have studied art history heavily in that time. What we can see, how, for example, in the self-portrait, you regard the the viewer, or also in this gym um, situation where we instantly have to think of Francis Bacon. But um, also here, you start already to study or to to. I, I would say you are in a permanent research. Um, within your paintings about the like classical questions, the body, the perspective, but also um, um, like different layers of perspectives that you have um, worked with. And again, here the people or parts of bodies are disappearing. Yeah, so, I think it's, um, uh, this is one of the first pictures that has a kind of a screen in it, um, which is a mirror at yeah. a gym. Um, and you see the character, it's characters on an, what some of us remember iPods and he's listening to an iPod as his body sort of becomes invisible. And I, I started depicting figures as invisible around this time because I started noticing when my friends were on, we were all just getting flip phones at the time and how so, when someone's on the phone in public, their body's not really there, it's kind of in another place. And I was interested in how, how this new technology that was all in, you know, a part of our lives through social media and phones very quickly was changing what it felt like to be with another person. 
And this was, of course, also during the millennium time where um, a lot of things changed. And uh, also when we look back to this today, I mean, technical devices will play a role in a lot of um, other works as well. But also this question and notion of scene, of scenery, of stage, which was, of course, also in one in your life as organizing parties, performances and events, uh, a very in, important um, part of, of, of your practice. And this is mainly also something that we wanted to put together within this exhibition to make it less about the painting itself, which is, of course, the main and major works in the exhibition, but still uh, to make more visible your thinking. And this is why we wanted to talk today about this weird um, and, um, and very scene-like, or it looks like a scenery in a club or in an artist studio, what we are now um, in having in focus. So. Can you let us know um, where we are now in 2000 and uh, what you had in this mind? This is 2007. Um, yeah. This was a series of works that, again, um, I thought of as functioning allegorically. They were actually a, a series of self-portraits in which, you know, it, instead of using the language of expressionist painting, which I was obviously quite always taken by, I liked the idea of allegory because it was kind of a way of working against the traditional um, manner in which ego or bravura would enter painting in a traditional sort of mid 20th century way. And allegory here is, is something that would be sort of depicting the making of a picture of myself staging a kind of a narrative tableau, much like having a party with, you know, musicians or a theater or a fashion show or something. Um, but I saw it as a kind of different way that, that an expression, expressionistic handling of paint could be used um, to do something different with painting. I think something that runs through the show is I'm always trying to find different ways to make paintings and think about them that might just put pressure on, um, you know, traditional ways of understanding or thinking about it. Mm -hmm. So here we have a stage set with, you know, lighting techs and, and music people and uh, performers of some sort. And basically it's staging the performing, the performance of the stuff of paint, you know, of just the painting. And it, it's not yeah. so much about me, um, you know, ex expressing my feelings about things so much as, I don't know, presenting a stage image as a subject. Mm -hmm. And uh, yes, wonderful. And then you more and more combine um, also digital methods within your work. And um, we just do some except, uh, ex excerpts of the exhibition, of course. And um, then you come to, um, we make a big step now of um, um, eight years, but um, where you use the computer and um, you again deal with art history, but in this case, very directly because you quote or you take an image of um, Simon Vouet, painting after Troy, which is uh, pixelated, printed on the canvas, and then you over paint and draw it. So this was a later series. I know we do a big step now, but... Uh... No, this is 2012. This is about four or five years later. I was thinking about uh, trying to build a, body, a model for this new body that I, I felt was so unusual in developing. Um, and I thought that it would be interesting to, to build a model for the body, uh, again, as a, as, a, as a different way of depicting something in a more analytic way, of grounding that in bodies from the ancient pre-modern past, you know, in this case, the 17th century, with that being a time in which, you know, the only way you could really see someone's body is to be with them in person. There was no mechanical reproduction, no photography, obviously no digital media. So it seemed like kind of a stable constant that I could use uh, these yeah. the raw material of these old bodies and old paintings to try to build this new scaffolding for a contemporary body. So all the paintings in this show, which is called After Troy, were made off of one painting by Simon Vouet from the 17th century. And I traced the four figures in the classical painting. And I traced them and tried to build one new body from this, what I call the scaffolding of the past, you know, these building 
kind of a new character out of four characters from an old painting, which I saw as a kind of a reverse relationship to cubism, you know, which is cubism was depicting one body from multiple points of view. And this was uh, depicting multiple bodies from one point of view compressed into one new ghostly shape, you know, this kind of contemporary nobody um, that uh, is formed from the raw material of the past. So this was kind of a, it worked in series as well. Um, so I would go through, I think I made 14 paintings in this series that all came from one uh, beginning image. Um, yeah. And it was, it was an image of, of when the Greeks sacked Troy and Virgil, um, Aeneas had to come get his, his, grand, his, his father out of the burning buildings, which I saw as something perhaps related to, you know, the changing status of, of the social dimension of life and, and of our relationship to our own bodies and our bodies of our friends. So it seemed mm -hmm. like a, a charged allegory to try to use for, uh, yeah, figuring out how to paint the body as it was changing. Yeah. And you can see some of the, some of the, the mark, marks are made by, by printing and computers. This is when I began using, uh, I would download the image from, in this case, the San Diego Museum of Art and just print parts of it and then seal that with a monochrome um, and then paint on top of it. So it was kind of a multimedia effort. Mm -hmm. And um, this is actually something you have tried out probably already in earlier paintings without using the computer. Probably we make a little view um, um, to, the, to this painting abstraction because you were talking earlier about abstraction mm -hmm. in general. And you don't mean with ab ab abstraction, abstraction versus figurative, but more abstraction in the way of communication, of being abstract in the world. And probably the, this a painting or this image is um, in our actual times so, um, again, so relevant, even if it's uh, 15 years old now. Um, that you have what we now live everyone and what we do actually at the moment with zooming together with you through this exhibition <laughs> that you have not seen in real and having, but here the two figures do the same and they communicate with other shadows in, in the sea in the, that we see appearing and disappearing. And <laughs> again, from the technology that they are using, we can see uh, that we are not in 2021, but earlier. <laughs> so also this was a series that you made in the time, right? That you did different kinds of like uh, suburban situations. In, yeah, I mean, these, uh, are, these are images of, of very common everyday scenarios in which I, I call them forces of abstraction um, for many years now. These these invisible forces that are, you know, created by the cloud and by internet servers and by undersea cables that are unknowingly perhaps affecting our lives, but we can't really see them. And in the process, often I chose to depict the characters once they are hit by the abstractions, they become invisible themselves. As you can see, this character on the left answers his flip phone and then he becomes uh, a kind of a ghost mm -hmm. um, as he leaves his the, the space he's in to traverse into another space. Um, so I would frequently use the body and kind of dematerialize it and then materialize it with paint. And it was really about the play between the stuff of paint and the what, what I came to be uh, printing as shadows eventually, these kind of dematerialized invisible body that we perform on a daily basis. But again, it's something like the space or the body in between, like in the very yeah. first uh, drawing that we saw in, in the alphabet, actually. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is something uh, which uh, threatens through the exhibition. And, um, and you have started actually to be installative. And we have one very large um, installation in our major um, large room that um, we will go now in. Um, and first of all, probably people can now see we are here really in a Gemälde Galerie in the Kunstverein. <laughs> we are really in a painting gallery, like in, a, um, in former times. Um, probably um, someone can come and put on one screen, which is off, which I see now. Um, here, please, from the team. And we start with the, with the microphone uh, that we see here, a very strange microphone, which comes from a vacuum cleaner. 
um, so this exhibition, this installation that you have done before and where you have sent us very precise measurements in order to be able to build these walls. Um, what is the idea behind it and how did it start? So yeah, I, I had always been using these installation elements, but I also had a relationship to film and video. And um, this particular um, project I, I made with my partner and collaborator, Alexandra Lerman. Um, the organizing principle for this series of three shows was a film we made called Your Vacuum Sucks. Uh, mm -hmm. and again, it started from a very um, kind of humorous, almost absurd experience I had when I was vacuuming my studio with this kind of shitty old vacuum cleaner from the 90s and it wasn't picking up dirt very well and I just kind of blurted out, God, this vacuum sucks. And then I, I stopped for a moment and I, I said, well, that's kind of a, you know, <laughs> that's kind of a metaphysical statement because if it works, it sucks. And if it doesn't work, it sucks. So. The question became, how could the vacuum not suck? And in, in English, we have this kind of colloquial uh, expression that the, the vacuum is taken to represent social space where you say, oh, I'm, yeah. I'm living in a vacuum. <laughs> yes. So that became a metaphor for what was happening to the social. And again, it became a, a kind of a narrative impulse to create these short episodic videos of my friends and I uh, in their, their social spaces and hopefully have this humorous, uh, engagement that doesn't suck. Um, so what you see is a, an installation with seven uh, color-coded chapters that are uh, seven videos and then a series of paintings for each episode. And you walk through this, I thought of it kind of like this fa fantasy space of a TV set or a film set and you experience yeah. this uh, narrative. And things that are in real, we will we can see in the film, we can see um, the real objects like ready-made or, or objet trouvé in the exhibition, like the vacuum cleaner, but also this sewing machine. And again, we see the same sewing machine and it will run later in the exhibition. So I just <laughs> stimulate, uh, <laughs> imitate this now, but it's too loud. Uh, I cannot hear you if I put it on, but so, please come whenever you, uh, we will be able to see the exhibition, people will realize also this notion of sound within the exhibition, which is not hearable at the moment. And um, also the films that can be watched in, um, in the exhibition. Um, but um, is it also, it's, it's very, it's speaking about humor in a, in a it's, it's so, it's also making people laugh. I don't know yeah. if Laura, is, Laura Berman, she wanted to join. He was, she was laughing so much when yeah. she came in. That was so great. <laughs> and, and again, you have these figures that appear on the painting, but they are also um, in, in yeah, kind of shadows that are following us here in the exhibition, right? <laughs> so the, the film and, and the according paintings have to do with uh, the story of um, the lead character of the film has been erased from the world. Alexander Lerman, my collaborator and I, we came up with a, a filmic technique that we could have a character be the central character that was erased. So it appears as a whole in the filmic image. Um, we had two, we have a, a process with two layers of film running on top of each other and anywhere my body uh, appears, I get, I, we cut a hole and you see through the hole to a different take of the same shot. Mm -hmm. And similarly in the paintings, you in the installation, you'll see characters appear as shadows that have been erased. And on the walls where the paintings would traditionally be, where the sewing machine in this case is, there's a hole yeah, made. Yeah. So it, the, the installation kind of tries to mimic the narrative of the film and the paintings follow that. And it's kind of a, a big multimedia um, kind of labyrinth, I thought of it as a time where you walk through this confusing, uh, very comedic story about this individual that's struggling to figure out if, he's, if he exists or if he's uh, imaginary or, and his body actually functions to feedback images of his friends he's interacting with, which I took to be kind of like how, almost how social media is now. When you... But it's also a little bit framing the real life in a way in the whole oh, yeah. story. We invite you all to see this, this film, Your Welcome Socks, some extraction of it on our website soon as a little pre-image of the exhibition. And we walk through it again. And also there are many smaller collages and um, in it and Probably these collages are also important to see how you work, how you structure, um, and how you um, 
think of of mm. of being uh, of 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 yeah constructing images and then again we have these moving elements um, in the exhibition i don't know if if it's understandable through this um camera wall probably what we should talk about is the dialogue for the film is all made through puns and wordplay um and everything kind of puns and words are, are words are often like the shadows of a word and and that's a lot where the humor comes through uh the script and i think this this idea of, of humor in, in in art is very important because it you know i think um we often laugh when we feel something together, but we don't really know exactly what's funny about it. And it's a kind of an invisible force of, of connectivity, you know, much like a, a kind of a, an imaginary technology that um, I think comedy really connects people in a way that few other things can. It's fun also to go through this labyrinth because, uh, and you see this things also the, because also the cables, they are like drawings. The electrical cords almost function as these kind of uh, diagrammatic drawing lines through the show that kind of mark the passage of your body through the room. Uh, but they also kind of diagram the connectivity between different elements in the show. Probably we can have a last view back on the your vacuum socks um, installation before we, we turn over to this, this very um, important idea that you have um, developed later um, what is also visible um, in these two um, works where we have once a flat work and then this relief work this idea of model of painting what you have invented um, what was the idea and the the initiation for it peter so the model was a, an idea I developed around 2014-15. Um, and at this time, I'd, I'd more or less been painting in a somewhat traditional way for about 20 years. You know, that is applying a, an inert material to a support. And I, I really began to feel that so little in life had to do with direct interaction or direct application that this, much like what I was saying about music in the, in the early 2000s, had also began to feel inadequate. So. I tried to, I just, I wanted to develop a new process for making paintings that somehow echoed, you know, the way that the distance in life that, I mean, now we're communicating through the computer literally. Um, and how could painting, you know, um, kind of create this distance maybe, and what would be a new device, which I called the model, this blank uh, relief that I distributed material into, how could that become a way to make paintings that kind of convey the feeling of distance that we have so much in, in the everyday world now. Um, and, you know, I thought a lot about how, say, we buy things, um, we buy things with, with, without currency. We use, we use money without currency through credit. We have social relations and sex without bodies. We, you know, have uh, violence and, you know, through video games now without, without you know, physical harm. Um, so what would that be for painting? And I thought that would be a kind of an indirect painting. Um, so this, this process I developed, um, I would build a three-dimensional relief that was made off of a drawing of my friends who were modeling for me. And then I would take a sculpt, take a photograph of the sculpture and print it out on, on canvas and paint on top of it. So these works, this, this period was really about the difference between the space of sculpture and the, the illusionistic space of painting. And it created this new strange kind of image of uh, space itself, you know? So this is an actual sculpture on the right and on the left you have uh, basically a printed um, photograph of the same sculpture with paint on it. Um, and it really- but again, again, here on this sculpture, you also have paint and printed uh, parts mm -hmm. and then the three-dimensional form comes out of a modulation in form, in foam, so it's, it's really, it's it's a lot of um, elements in there, and and it's really hard to depict either the bodies nor the the, the perspectives. And it's it's like um, many um, street views put together to one, or many 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 different perspectives. Yeah, I thought of this 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 idea of a model almost like a almost like a smartphone or a computer. It's kind of an empty it's an empty three dimensional structure. You know. Mm -hmm. So once this is photographed in the computer, I can distribute information into it, much like when someone sends you a, 
a photograph on your phone or you take a picture, you then send it somewhere else. So this, this empty blank thing, the information passes through and then it's sent elsewhere, was meant to kind of be a model of how our computers work, you know, and this, mm -hmm. this infrastructure, I call it this three dimensional relief space was kind of made to, I intended that to suggest the kind of hardware, you know, almost like the, you know, the, the physicality or materiality of, of undersea cables and server farms and satellites, these very <laughs> handmade analog, actually sculptural um, networks that, that maintain and allow us to communicate today that we kind of take for granted. Um, we think of the digital as this invisible thing up in the sky, but it's actually a very physical material reality, um, much like these, these relief sculptures themselves. This is the painting as model with, with this sculpture in the middle. And the more you turn around it, and um, it becomes more and more um, like a, you can see again the story and a lot of mm. Um, interactions between people which are happening here and um, again we we have in this space a film that um, is very important to you as I understood so um, yeah so this this was a project um, it was called bubble revision and it was an effort to create a collaborative painting show with two friends of mine Avery Singer and Alexander Carver and we had the idea to, uh, as a collaborative idea for a painting show, which is unusual, as I've always wanted to try, we had the idea of building a collaborative virtual space together. So we modeled this uh, architectural space um, that was a 3D model uh, that exists as a video that you can walk through. Um, and our idea was that all of our paintings would be set within this imaginary virtual space. And that would be a different way of collaborating that we thought had a kind of a politics to it of building a new you know, space together as a group. So all of our paintings actually take place in the space of this video here. Um, and it unfolds in this, this, this unseemly world in which many of the uh, unfortunate uh, activities on the internet become the narrative um, scenes that are depicted in the paintings in the room. Like for example, this one where you see this figure in the middle, it's um, it's 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 really like it, it looks also like uh, like iconographically, it lo it looks like a Christ Christian iconography, and at the same time, it's mm -hmm. in the it's again like all your um, like all your um, images in an inner room. It's it's rarely um, outside of an inner room, right? That what you where you put people together and scenery together yeah so this this scene is a in in the virtual model there's a place we call the humiliation theater and many activities like this are the are the um form the narratives of these paintings of people you know doing things to each other that are enabled by the space of the virtual that would not be possible otherwise. And it's again this this idea or this notion of staging of what is in a lot of works visible um, uh, of, of being in a stage, but in a very strange way. <laughs> <laughs> the, the last um, version or the last um, series that you did in 2000, because we also name it in the subtitle of the exhibition 1991 to 2020 when we wanted to open the show <laughs> <laughs> and um, and you this is uh, one of the series of the sims paintings and here um, i think it's so um, astonishing because um, the way of painting the the head of the woman or the avatar in the in the game um you you kind of it's, it's really fading away and it's less opaque mm -hmm. compared to the other to your earlier way of um painting in, in in a way of technical so so inventions or trying to have different kind of um ductus duct how do you call it in English <laughs> that you that you use? <laughs> yeah, I think this series was this was so this was just last year. Um, it was a show I had in New York called Shifted Sims. Um, and I was really trying to bring together all these different languages I've of painting that I've I've explored over the last 20 years. Um, but this this project started from the feeling when COVID began that I think like we're doing again now, I felt like I was living a simulation of the life I had 
before, you know, and everything I had taken for granted before I had to now do through a screen and through Zoom. So it made sense to try to, I think, set a series of paintings inside of an actual simulation game, which is Sims is the most popular simulation game in the world, arguably at this point with 40 million participants. So all of the images are of, of actual avatars, an avatar mm -hmm. being a image of a body that's being controlled by someone else. Um, and for painting, I thought that was a really interesting challenge of how can I depict a body that's being actually navigated by a different body that could be entirely different. So now we have this literal distance being depicted in both in life and in, and in the images of the game unfolding here in which these are actual avatars that I found on chat rooms and, you know, and on, on screenshots from actual players in the game. So everyone you're seeing here is being in fact controlled by another. Is it the first time in your work that you do not use, uh, because in all the other works you use, uh, the beginning is still a, a human being that you either photograph in your studio or mm -hmm. do live uh, drawings of them. Is it the first time that you take an avatar as a model? Yeah, it is the first time I use an avatar, but um, I would say the art historical paintings also represent, um, you know, a kind of a, a, an appropriated source of uh, in a similar way. So these are in a way found images of actual people that are once removed from themselves. Um, as complicated mm -hmm. as that sounds, it's actually the way that so much of our lives work now. Like when you see, just for example, in this Zoom, you see images of profile icons with a name and you don't know who's behind it. That's very much how I felt about these avatars here and how can I depict those profile icons uh, that are such a part of just, you know, making a phone call every day. Yeah, so we are not doing a phone call now, but um, I think this is a good starting point to involve people. And so I don't know if you have um, already formulated questions, but I'm sure we um, can um, um, continue and having the communication in, um, uh, and I will drop out of the image now here and give over the voice to Sergei Harutunian, who nicely did the whole world time collecting um, comments and impressions. Thank you, Kathleen, and especially thank you, Peter, for this wonderful tour. And now we will proceed with the question and answer uh, round. What influences you most at the moment, or are there any such influences? I started modeling um, my figures within a three-dimensional uh, rendering program software um, in what's called a rig. Um, so I'm actually building the characters myself inside the computer first, and then bringing them into the painting, as opposed to appropriating them uh, mm -hmm. from other sources. So I think this, this dive into the, 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 the game playing is, is getting deeper. But it's also embracing the contemporary language of, of drawing, which is uh, three-dimensional rendering. That's what I'm working on at the moment. What I think is also interesting for our audience um, um, is the, I, the, the fact that you are, you're dealing with this post-internet issues and also this idea of um, in between the real and the analog, the analog and the digital world. And there's a whole generation of people who are about 10 or 20 years younger than you. And um, I heard from many other artists that you are kind of an artist artist uh, <laughs> reference figure for them. Like, um, um, but I know you are also friends with people like every singer or other um, people of this generation. But um, I, I think, um, isn't it um, in being 50 years old now, um, um, isn't, I think the perception is different. So you have um, kind of seen the, the development of the internet. Um, what do the younger generation ask you for questions or what is your exchange about or your dialogues? What are the topics you talk about? I mean, this one film that we saw also shows your utopian ideas of spacing. Um, so what is the discourse within the artist scene you are surrounded by in New York now? <laughs> well, I, my generation, I think, is different from the Generation X, we are called. Um, yeah. Is the last generation that re I remember life before the internet as an adult, you know? Um, I got email when I was 32 years old. So I had a very much a fully formed um, 
social way of having a social life before being, you know, something like a digital native, you would call it, like a younger person that grew up with the internet in school and didn't imagine, can't imagine life before that. So I think I have a slightly different perspective than uh, the millennial generation that um, I could see the changes, the, the optimism and the hope and the utopianism and then the commercialization and privatization and then the effects of that to have a different point of view um, than someone that's 10 or 15 years younger than me, which creates for really interesting conversations, obviously. Yeah. Okay, Peter, we have two guests who are asking the same question. What kind of work is that in the background? <laughs> they are really <laughs> curious to know. Uh, this one right here is actually the model for this, the painting in your room six there, um, uh, room five actually. Um, so I wanted to put it in here because I pulled it out of storage to, because you have this actual work in the show. So you, you can see what it looks like in my studio here. Um, <laughs> so this is a very uh, Baroque sculpture of sorts that uh, has many, many layers of foam core. Um, yeah. It's almost like a three-dimensional Photoshop file in a way. <laughs> in the show, there are a lot of art historical references, Peter. I'm a bit curious, how did you came to, to painting in general? Like you were, uh, the earliest paintings are from uh, 1995, the 83 Ultra States of America. And uh, before, how did you decide for yourself to deal with painting? It was like your starting point. Now you're dealing with installations and the film, but why? Uh, starting with painting? Oh, it's complicated. Um, when I moved to New York, I, I was living in California where it was a lot easier to, uh, you know, find people to help me make my films. When I moved to New York, it was, you know, very regulated and expensive and it was very hard to, I didn't know many people. So it, there was a practicality to it mm. of uh, trying to do something that only required myself, but also strangely wanting to learn the language and the tools of of an older, an earlier time period, you know, and I actually at one point went back to school to learn classical painting techniques because I was really curious how an image was made three and 400 years ago. Um, mm -hmm. And I thought maybe that could, learning about that could change the way I looked at uh, contemporary art. But was it also at CalArts? Because I remember a story when I spoke to a student of Gerhard Merz in Düsseldorf at the Academy and she did figurative sculpture, Paloma Vaga Weiss, that was somehow forbidden or for Gerhard yeah. Merz class from this conceptual and um, 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 yeah, surrounding. And was this, this at CalArts also oh, probably, yeah. did you not, um, did you not try it out then because of the conceptualism power that you were engaged with? Yeah, I, I, I came to painting through the very weird back door of, of kind of institutional critique. And, you know, Michael Asher was my teacher and Michael he was Asher. very, very many, the, the program at the time was a very hardcore, you know, leftist, feminist, Marxist program that really put pressure on the idea of not making objects for sale, for sale, you know, commercial, commercial art. Um, so everything was very much based in theory and philosophy and thinking of you know the dematerialized art object. And I think there was part of me that wanted to strangely learn how to do that precisely because of what was so forbidden in the early 90s. Um, mm -hmm. And if you wanted to make a painting at CalArts, you really had to justify every aspect of making that painting. It was almost like a perverse um, <laughs> game in which you had to like form the language around defending yourself, um, when in New York, that would have been just something you would do intuitively and expressively. On the West Coast and conceptualism at the time, there was a real resistance against the traditional forms, I think, which I really appreciated because it made me have to justify to myself why I wanted to make art objects to sell to people in galleries. And it was very difficult at the time, you know? Um, it's also this in between that you are now playing. It's in between, even if you do gallery exhibitions, it's not um, it's not only painting what I saw in your last exhibitions. It's also about your films. It's also about the idea of making spaces and having always this notion of space between again. Kathleen and I have been joking for months now about how weirdly appropriate it is that I'm, you know, for seeing my show for the first time with everyone else. Yes. <laughs> and then a view back on my life that even I haven't seen with my own head. Um, and I'm really grateful, Kathleen, that you've persevered and Sergey to, to make this happen. But uh, 
it's, it is weirdly appropriate that what we're talking about is kind of being echoed by the form in which we're taking to talk about it. Um, <laughs> so I'm just really grateful that it's, that it's, you're giving it a chance to happen and I'm, I hope I can come there soon to see it. Um, we're desperately looking forward to open finally your exhibition and of course also meet our members and visitors in person. It's really something missing here for us. Of course, we can like communicate in a digital form with our uh, with our members, with all of our visitors. But it's of course it makes a huge difference. Sadly, yeah. <laughs> I hope so too. But um, thank you so much for doing this uh, event today, and um, pretty appreciate it. Vielen Dank an alle. Vielen Dank zu Hause um, an alle, die da sind. Und um, beim nächsten Mal sehen wir uns dann wieder. Einen schönen Sonntagabend und auf hoffentlich bald am nächsten Mittwoch ist das erste Künstlergespräch mit Dinghard Androlat um 19 Uhr. Seien Sie gerne dabei, da gibt Dinghard Androlat spannende Einblicke im Gespräch mit mir, Serge Harotonan, in das Werk von Peter Skurwerf. Wir freuen uns, Sie dann wiederzusehen. Thank you very much, Peter. We talk soon anyway and um, looking forward having you soon here. All the best yeah. and um... I'm looking forward as well. Thank you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers. <laughs>